Hey, good morning, and may God's blessings be on you, and may God's blessings be absolutely overflowing. There is no shortage of goodness with our God, and he has no shortage of ability to bless us. And so I would ask that his blessing be upon all of you here today. As you know, Mike is out of town, and he's asked me to speak, so, well, you get what you get. Have you ever been discouraged in prayer? Have you ever found it difficult to ask God for something? Have you ever felt aimless in prayer, like life was so mundane, so tiring, so routine, that you just couldn't pray? Or maybe it was this, have you ever had trouble believing that God would hear you? Or maybe it was this, you've prayed for something very important for months, even years, and you haven't seen God's hand, and so you just give up. That's what I call being discouraged in prayer. I have been there, I am guilty on every count there, and I suspect most of us are as well. And now, the scriptures, the scriptures do give us a lot of reasons to pray. Um, God asks us to pray, that's a good reason. And if you read Luther, Luther says that God commands you to pray. If that isn't ominous enough. We can turn to the New Testament. Jesus is always preaching on prayer. That's a constant theme that runs through everything. And, um, for example, he says, Whatever you ask for in my name, believe you have received it, and it will be yours. That's just one of his sayings. That should encourage us to pray. And of course, the New Testament doesn't end there. All the apostles who write the letters that follow encourage us to pray. For example, Paul says, pray without ceasing, which I take to mean don't give up. Just that simple. And yet, we still get discouraged in prayer. Or at least I do. And so today I want to look for encouragement to pray from Elijah in the Old Testament lesson. And as we look at Elijah, we're going to let James, the Apostle James, guide us. Because James is going to see something in Elijah's life that can help make us bold to pray. Something in Elijah's life that can lift that discouragement and something in Elijah's life that, on his own, Steve would have missed. And I suspect most of us would have missed it, except James is really astute. So, it seems appropriate to start the sermon in prayer, doesn't it? We're going to even talk about prayer. So pray with me, please. Father, We look to you to lead us into prayer. We look to you to give us strength to pray. And we look to you to give us strength to believe. And Father, of course, we look to you because you give all good gifts. In Jesus' name, amen. Elijah. Elijah was a prophet. That means God sent him to call his people out of idolatry back to worshiping him. And now there were many prophets, many, many prophets, but Elijah, notoriety, Elijah ascends to hero status as far as the prophets go. Let's look at the things he did. He single-handedly takes on all the prophets of idolatry. Nobody helps. He does it himself. He does Miracles. He stands up to the king. Oh, we'd like that. He meets with God face to face and talks with him. And if that isn't enough, he's taken up to heaven in the chariot, right? Oh, yeah. He's a prophet. And legend 
around Elijah. At his time, people thought that the Holy Spirit would whisk him away and put him somewhere else. So you couldn't trust that he would be where you thought he was because the Spirit might just move him. And at Jesus' time, the Jews were all looking for Elijah because they're expecting Elijah to bring in the kingdom of God. And we hear this rumor written in the Gospels, right? They go up to John the Baptist, and what do they ask him? Hey, John, are you actually Elijah incognito? So the legend is going full steam at the time of Jesus. And to add to that, Jesus goes up on the Mount of Transfiguration, and who does he meet? He meets Moses and Elijah. What an honor. This guy gets called out of heaven, back to earth, just to meet with Jesus. Or maybe the Mount of Transfiguration somehow kissed heaven at that time. Who knows? So, yes, he is a hero, and he's a great hero. Now, we've got to be careful with this thing about heroes. Heroes always do bigger-than-life things, don't they? And they talk bigger than life. And common folk like us, well, we like that bigger than life. But James is going to point out that if we look in the bigger than life spot, we miss it all. We have to look at just how human Elijah is. And that's where the encouragement to pray is. Okay? So, let's get the bigger story of Elijah. And I'm going to back up, oh, 120 years from Elijah's day. God brings the 12 tribes of the Israelites into the promised land, and King David is the king. 40 years, and in his 40 years, he takes these 12 disparate tribes and turns it into a nation. After him, Solomon reigns for 40 years. And he makes homeland security a big deal. And they prosper. And he builds the temple. And it's now firmly set in place. God's people. But there's a rift. There's a problem. The ten tribes that were up north are saying this. I don't want to pay so much tax. Do you? No, I don't. And I don't want a king from down south in Judah, I want one of our own. And so the ten northern tribes split off from the two southern tribes, and the northern tribes get the name Israel, the southern tribes get the name Judah, and the nation splits. And as soon as it splits, this is right with Solomon's death, as soon as it splits, the northern tribe wanders off into idolatry and never, never comes back. That's how all this starts. Now we're going to roll the clock forward 65 years. 65 years. I turned 65 this year. So we're going to roll the clock forward from this split in the nation one whole lifetime forward. And seven kings have come and gone in the northern kingdom. All of them were evil. And now King Ahab is there. And King Ahab reigns 22 years. This is the time of Elijah. Elijah comes in in the middle of this reign. King Ahab's there 22 years and no coups. Hey, that's pretty good. Ahab keeps things quiet in the kingdom. People can live normal lives. Hey, that's pretty good too. Ahab forms a strategic alliance, a military alliance, with the king of Sidon up on the north along the Mediterranean Sea. Shore up that border. Hey, that's good too, isn't it? And then Ahab, with a quiet hometown, homeland, creates a strong economy. That's good. I don't turn that one down. And he wants to keep the agricultural sector running well, which he wants, and we'll see that later. And then against all odds, Ahab wins two big wars. Ben-Hadad, he's this guy up in Syria, up in Damascus, comes and invades. This would be like the United States invading against this little country. This is the big power coming down to invade. But King Ahab 
collaboratively with his advisors, repels them, not once, but twice. Hey, that's a good king, isn't it? Kept the homeland safe. And then one more thing. After that last expulsion of Ben-Hadad, King Ahab sets up a market in Damascus. Sounds like an obscure little fact. What he's doing is he's leveraging economic control in the heart of his enemy's territory. Okay, That's King Ahab. So, in short, Ahab probably looked like a good king to the peasants. Okay, Could well have looked like a good king. And matter of fact, we might say today, this guy is re-electable. He looks pretty good. And he could have been a hero for many, many, many of the peasants. Okay, But now we hear what the Bible describes Ahab as. The Bible says, Ahab did more evil in the sight of the Lord than all who went before him. Ahab did more evil. Hmm. I guess we shouldn't elevate him to a hero, should we? Though he ran the country well, he continued to worship the golden calf, that idol from long ago that was set up. He brought in some more idols. He brought in Baal worship, and he brought in Asherah worship. And he marries Jezebel, who's this passionate evangelist for idolatry. And so when Elijah bursts on the scene, we have a contest between two heroes. There's Ahab, the king, and there's Elijah, the prophet. There's Ahab, the earthly hero, and Elijah, the godly hero. So what do we read? The first thing we read, and this would have been in the lesson before this week, maybe two weeks ago even, Um, Elijah comes up to Ahab and confronts him. He says, Ahab, it is not going to rain for three years. And he walks out. A few years? A few years? No rain? God sends the drought, and things get very, very hard. People are starving. And... Ahab makes a funny mistake here. He attributes the drought to Elijah, not to God. You see, what this should have been was, it was a sign for Ahab. A wake-up call. Ahab, you can't serve these idols and expect God's blessing. God is taking you by the cuff of the neck, and he's going to shake you. A real wake-up call. Ahab does what most rulers do. He ignores the sign. Let's just keep going. Okay, the drought gets bad and Elijah hides. God tells him to hide in a ravine. And some ravens bring him food. Perhaps this is the first recorded event of carryout. I'm not sure. As the drought continues, Ahab does not repent. Instead, he puts a bounty on Elijah's head. He says, hey, if I can end Elijah, I can end the drought. And if I end the drought, I restore the agricultural economy. And that's good. So, no repentance there. The drought gets bad, and where Elijah is hanging out, the water dries up. God tells him, go up north to Sidon. So he goes up there. He goes up north, moves in with a widow, and God does miraculous things with Elijah up there. As long as he's in the house, they have bread to eat. That pot of flour, that bottle of oil, they just never run out as long as Elijah's in the house. Another miracle happens. The widow's son dies, blames, and the widow blames Elijah. And Elijah takes the son and prays, and God restores the son. So a little interlude in the main story. But now the drought needs to end, and God sends Elijah back down to Ahab. So he comes down to Ahab, and Ahab says to him, as soon as he sees Elijah, he says, You, does anybody know what he calls him? You troubler of Israel. Who has given Israel all the trouble? Ahab, right? No, but he's going to call Elijah, you troubler of Israel, and to In the impasse, Elijah says, we're going to have a contest between the Lord 
and between Baal. Bring all the common folk, like you and me, out to the slopes of Mount Carmel. It's about 15 miles away. Bring all the prophets of Baal and Asherah, that's 850 in total, who eat at the king's table and the expense of everybody else, bring them along and bring two bowls. And here's what we're going to do. You, can, you guys will set up your altar, and I'll set up my altar. You pray, I pray, and whoever calls down fire from heaven must be the prophet of the true God. Only the true God could bring fire from heaven. So that's the contest. The common people like you and me, they say, yeah, that's a good contest. And I bet some of the teenage boys were saying, and I got to watch. Okay? And so the contest day comes, and the prophets of Baal and Asherah set up their altar and start dancing, and start shouting, and start singing and start whatever their rituals were to call down fire from heaven. Goes all morning. Noon comes. No fire. Elijah gets an idea. He walks around, and he's not polite here. He starts jeering. He said, hey, I know the problem. Baal is asleep. You need to shout a little louder to wake him up. Oh, oh maybe this is the problem. He's gone on vacation. He's on a trip somewhere. Or, oh, I know what it is. Baal is indisposed. The text actually says that, okay? He's saying, your God is in the bathroom right now. Okay. So what do they do? Well, they slash themselves, they dance all the more vigorously, they work up a lather until dinner time, no fire. And then Elijah tells the common folk and says, come close here, gather around, I want you to see this. He builds an altar with 12 stones, he puts the wood on it, he slaughters the bull and puts the sacrificed bull on it. And then he says, would you go get those four jars of water, fill them up and bring them and pour them on the altar. So they'd bring these big jars of water and pour it on the altar. Uh, not enough. Let's do it again. Four more jars. We're almost there. Four more jars. So 12 jars of water on the altar. The bowl is soaked. The wood is soaked. The stones are soaked. There was a ditch around it. It's soaked. The water's filled it up. The water is flowing everywhere. And then Elijah prays. And here's what he prays. O oh Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel. These ten northern tribes that have wandered off in idolatry. Let it be known that you are the God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Elijah prays and fire falls from heaven and devours the bull, devours the wood, devours the stones, and laps up all the water. Now let me ask you, is that a sign that Ahab should have figured out? I think so. Well, the common people figured it out. They start chanting, the Lord is God, the Lord is God. And on Elijah's order, they round up those 850 prophets of Baal and execute them, Baal and Asherah. A gruesome scene, the passage spends one verse on it. That's all we're going to say about it. And Elijah goes and tells Ahab the most important thing, not really. Ahab, go have dinner. So Ahab, I guess he pick, pulls out his picnic basket and has dinner. Meanwhile, Elijah clambers up, climbs up to the top of Mount Carmel and prays. And he prays, Father, send rain. He looks out, no clouds. He prays a second time, no clouds. He prays three times. You get the idea, right? He prays the seventh time. And this little cloud appears out on the horizon, the size of a man's hand, it says, real small. 
Elijah says, a rain is coming. He clambers down the mountain and tells Ahab, pack up your dinner, get on your chariot, and drive home fast or you'll get stuck in the mud. The rain is going to be so thick you won't get your chariot home. And then it rains. And it pours. Should Ahab have paid attention to that sign? Yeah. Now, this feels like the climax, doesn't it? The hero just won, the bad guy lost. That feels like a climax, right? This is where the story's supposed to end, right? It doesn't. And it's important to see what happens. It's not the, and they lived happily ever after. It's what happens after this that we've got to pay real close attention to. Ahab gets home and tells Jezebel. Jezebel is furious and puts a price on Elijah's head. She sends a messenger and tells him, look, um, may the gods kill me if by this time tomorrow you're not dead. Elijah runs for his life, as well he should. Jezebel is ruthless, dangerous, and angry. But now something is different. Elijah's tired. He should have gotten a rest, but he didn't. Elijah's tired. The buzz is worn off. His coffee's run out if they had coffee then. And Elijah doesn't seem to be a superhero anymore. And he gets so tired in his running south away from this that he asks God to kill him. Here's what he said. It is enough, O Lord, now. Take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. Yeah, just kill me. Elijah is in the pit of exhaustion and wants to be done, but God isn't done. God sends miraculous meals and two big sleeps, and Elijah marches down to Mount Horeb, it said in our reading, that's Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, he meets God face to face. Maybe this is the start of the turnaround for this superhero. God asks him, why are you here? Elijah, why'd you come? Not as in what drove you here, but why'd you come here? Why didn't you come and talk to me up in Judah or near Samaria? Or why'd you come all the way down here to meet me? Elijah tells God this. I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the prophets of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I alone, am left and they seek my life to take it away. Elijah doesn't mention miracles in his prayers. Elijah doesn't mention God's miraculous provision. And so what we hear in his prayers right here is deep, deep exhaustion. This is the voice of exhaustion. Well, this isn't the end of Elijah. God speaks with him, sends him on another mission, um, you could read about that. It's only eight chapters, Elijah, in total in the Old Testament. But we're going to turn our attention to a simple question now. How can this life of Elijah, this superhero of faith, this miracle worker, um, this man who can take on all these prophets at once, this guy who evades the king and the queen, how can he encourage us in prayer? You know, I might be impressed with Elijah. Yeah, that guy's really good. But he's out of my league. I wouldn't compare myself with Elijah. That's what Steve is saying. Um, how could I? Elijah does miracles. Do I do miracles? Just ask my wife. You'll find out I do not do miracles. Sometimes I can make a mess of things, but I don't do miracles to fix it. Okay? So I wouldn't compare myself with Elijah, I would admire him, but I wouldn't make that comparison. However, the Apostle James has a different idea. Listen to what James says in his writing, the letter in the New Testament. He writes, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crop. Did you catch that? 
went by real quick. Elijah was a man just like us. That's what James writes. Elijah was just like me, Steve. Elijah was just like you, Andy. Elijah was just like any of us. Oh, James, you've got it wrong. He's a superhero. I am not a superhero. And in fact, James skips a bunch of things. He skips Elijah calling down fire from heaven. He skips Elijah's miracles. He skips meeting God face to face. He skips being taken to heaven in a chariot, alive without dying. Matter of fact, James skips everything that is heroic about Elijah, and he just wants to consider how oh so human Elijah is. Elijah gets tired, he gets exhausted, so exhausted he wants to die. Elijah is just oh so human. And in fact, so are you. So am I. We get tired, we get exhausted. James is saying, ignore those super things. Look at just how human this Elijah is. And there's more to that. Elijah, when he gets tired, his faith gets shaky. Did you see that in his prayers? I am the only one left, the only prophet left. But he knew that wasn't so. I'm running for my life. They want to kill me. But God had always protected him. And on top of that, earlier, he'd asked God to kill him. Well, why not let the other people kill him? Then he'd be done either way, right? Okay, so his faith gets shaky. What we see is Elijah gets tired, and his faith gets shaky. And we get tired, and our faith can get shaky. Here again, ignore the super things that Elijah does, and just consider how human he is. So two points that Elijah makes, or James makes, Elijah is just like you, just like every one of you, and he prays. That's James' whole point here. So at least according to James, Elijah is our hero as he prays alone, not out in public, none of the public things, none of the big things the quiet things when he's alone. And he's a hero because he's just so much like you and me. And he prays. Now, how do we get this from a nice little idea in James into my actual life of prayer? Right? I assume we come so that we can maybe live God's word a little better as opposed to just come and know it a little better. Here's what I would suggest. I would suggest meditating on scriptures. This is a practice described in um, the book of Joshua, so long before this text, in the Psalms and the Proverbs. It's all over in the Bible. And it's an ancient practice, but it's a very simple one. Take the thoughts and roll them over. Don't be in a hurry to say, okay, got it, move on. Just roll the thought over. So it'd be like this. Muse on on Elijah. How human is this guy? Call to mind, think of him running for his life. Think of him being so tired. Think of him begging God for these things. And then, while you're musing on those, muse on God answering his prayers. So, here this guy is exhausted, and God is answering his prayers. And then in your meditation, bring in one more muse. Add yourself to the picture just like James does. James says, Elijah was a man just like us. So here I'm musing, here's Elijah who gets tired. Here's me who gets tired. Here's Elijah whose faith gets shaky. Here's me whose faith gets shaky. Here's God who's answering Elijah's faith and God who's answering Elijah's prayers. Well, God will answer my prayers. That's the simple idea of meditation that we would find throughout it. So, one last perspective on prayer. God listens to our prayers because we are people. It's precisely because we're human that God answers. We don't need to be super Christians or super believers or super anything to bend God's ear. We simply need to be faithful and pray. 
As James says, the prayer of a righteous man or woman is powerful and effective. Ah, and lest we as good Lutherans, we are good Lutherans, aren't we? Unless we as Lutherans get sidetracked by the word righteous here, saying, I'm not righteous, I'm not righteous. No, that James is just using this, the prayers of a righteous man. He's using that term righteous just to describe those who faithfully follow Jesus, such as ourselves. And of course, in Christ, we are clothed in righteousness. So, are you discouraged in prayer, or have you been discouraged in prayer? Apostle James would say this, no problem, just look at Elijah for your hero of prayer. He was just, oh, so human, and I know you are too. That's what James would tell us. Elijah prayed and God answered because, well, God answers people who ask. 